Welcome to Science Fiction 101, the podcast series where we look at the science fiction field from all angles, past, present and future. I'm Phil. And I'm Colin. And today is the 24th of July 2023 and we're going to be exploring fuzzies, alien creatures devised by H. Beam Piper and updated by John Scalzi. We'll also have our usual roundup of recommendations of past, present and future science fiction. Well, last time we talked about The Empire Strikes Back and we had some responses from our listeners. So thanks to those who contacted us. Emmanuel said, excellent episode. Uh, He says, it's really interesting to learn more about how a script and a movie are made. They are living things and it's remarkable how crucial elements can sometimes be added at the last moment. And he also said that he would have laughed out loud at Colin's dad joke if only there was air to breathe. It was the, uh, the one about there being no atmosphere on the moon, I think. So. <laughs> uh, Joey wrote, great episode. I agree with Colin that some of those themes should make it into Star Wars Visions series. And then he says there's a podcast called Best Movies Never Made that did a multicast reading of Lee Brackett's script that's definitely worth checking out. And Colin, I think you did check it out because you said you found it was a two part episode from December 2019. That's right. Um, And Andy wrote, I enjoyed that. This is what we like to hear, folks. Uh, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but only stuff that's inside the films. I've never been into all the peripheral stuff like directors, writers, actors. So this episode was interesting. But as always, you two carried a subject that wasn't to my interests and still made it great fun. So uh, thank you, Andy. (laughs) That's a nice compliment. That's what we do best, I think. (laughs) Yeah. We take the stuff that you're not interested in and we make it slightly listenable. <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's that, by the way, it's that kind of attitude, that kind of response that has led us to be named by Feedspot.com as now being the fifth best UK sci-fi podcast. Isn't that amazing? We used to be at number six. We're now at number five. So we're slowly climbing the league table there. And, and maybe someday we can make it to the uh, the Locus or the Hugos or other awards. Who knows? Yes. T- today, Feedspot.com, which nobody has ever heard of. Sorry, Feedspot. <laughs> uh, uh, tomorrow, big awards. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you want to join in the conversation, you can post comments on our blog at 101sf.blogspot.com or you can find us on Facebook as Science Fiction 101 Podcast. Colin, could you introduce us, please, to our main topic for today, which is fuzzies? Yes. You know, longtime listeners of the podcast will know that I'm a fan of John Scalzi and his works. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read his books. I read his articles. I follow him on Twitter. That's starting to sound kind of scary, but I trust you. It's just, just <laughs> interest. Um, I enjoy what he writes a lot. And about 15 years ago, he wrote a book called Fuzzy Nation. Mm-hmm. And he said it was a reimagining of a work by one of his favorite authors, H. Beam Piper. Yeah. And so for this podcast, I suggested to Phil that we would read the original Little Fuzzy from 1962 and then read John Scalzi's reimagining, updating, rebooting of it from 2005 and, you know, compare and contrast. It's a bit like watching a film that is a remake of an earlier film. And I have to say, reading these two books in rapid succession, I find it very difficult to remember what happened in the one book and what happened in the other. Um, You you get confused in your memory as to what what happened in the one and didn't happen in the other. Is is that the same for you? uh, Well, no. My the other podcast that I'm on, Take Me to Your Reader, we we do adapted works and Mm. I've done this kind of an exercise a hundred and ten uh, yeah. times, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I've gotten very used to you know trying to keep. Okay, this was here and this was there, and I do take. Uh, I wouldn't say extremely detailed notes, but little highlights to try and draw my mind back into one versus the other. Right. Yeah. When I was doing my PhD, I used to. Uh, well, I I had to compare lots of different script versions of a thing, and then compare it to the film that was made from the script. 
And so I had to do that as well, keep really quite detailed notes, because when you start reading the first script, you never know which bits of that script are going to carry forward to the second draft, the third draft, and, and then into the film. So yeah, I used to do that. But it, it, to me, that's that's like work. So <laughs> for a podcast, <laughs> I don't feel like doing that. Um, but what, what I did do as I was reading Little Fuzzy, I highlighted bits of text on my Kindle where uh, something seemed either good or important or was worthy of discussion. And I intended to then do that with the Scalzi book, but in fact, I just found that it was so similar to the first book that I I hardly made any notes at all. Um, anyway, we can talk about um, how they compare later on. But should we first of all talk about Little Fuzzy in isolation? Um, yes, let's talk about the past. Yeah, and then we can move on to the present and possibly the future. Um, I think I'd read Little Fuzzy before, um, or at least part of it. I'm pretty sure when I was a child, something like seven, eight or nine years old, I'm pretty sure I had some kind of book that had Little Fuzzy in it. I don't think it would have been the entire novel. That seems very unlikely to me. But it's possible that it was some kind of anthology that had just a, a selection from uh, Little Fuzzy. and. The scene that, as I was reading the Little Fuzzy now as an adult, the scene where really we first get to know Little Fuzzy and we see him uh, interacting with a human, um, that scene was very, very familiar to me. So I'm certain mm. I read it uh, as a child. Uh, you know, it was a no nominated for a Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1963. So it wow. was probably fairly well known back yes. in the day. And yet the author is not that well known today, is he? No. I can't remember when he was born, but I know that he died about two years after this book was published. And uh, yep. in fact, he took his own life. Apparently he was in very dire economic circumstances um, and possibly had been going through a bad divorce as well. And he took his own life. In fact, that's why we have this book uh, available as an as an ebook from Gutenberg and other sources, mm -hmm. um, he put all of his works into the public domain, uh, kind of despite his uh, inheritors. I think is probably the right word, mm. which might include his wife at the time. Yeah, as far as I know, almost his entire body of work is in the public domain, whereas mm -hmm. his contemporaries, who would have been people like Heinlein and Asimov. Um, much of their work is still in copyright because the copyrights were renewed at the appropriate times. His birth date was 1904. Okay, actually, so that makes him a little bit older than uh, the other authors I just mentioned. Yeah, he was he would have been about 60 when he took his life. and Yeah. Uh, he was a little eccentric, as I think science fiction authors and maybe <laughs> science fiction readers and podcasters <laughs> tend to be. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I wear that, well, that title pretty accurately. <laughs> And Little Fuzzy, like I said, was very was pretty popular. It was nominated for a Hugo. There was a sequel that came out in 1964. And then, yeah, he tragically took his own life. Mm -hmm. uh, he assigned all of his works to uh, John Carr, the uh, science fiction author. And John has managed those assets, I'd say, pretty well. Uh, many of the many of the series that Piper was known for has he has carried on either licensing works to other authors or uh, continuing to develop himself. Wow. Many writers have had a go at either writing a sequel to uh, the fuzzy stories or um, sort of rebooting them as Scalzi has done. Ace Books hired people to do some related works. Ah, okay. And in uh, 1984, they actually found a lost Piper manuscript. Okay. Yeah. And that was published as Fuzzies and Other People. And then there were uh, a handful of other sequels. Do you feel up to summarizing the plot of Little Fuzzy? Yes. So we're introduced to Jack Holloway, twirling his mustache, smoking his pipe and having a drink. <laughs> and he is a prospector, a, a science fiction prospector on another planet mm -hmm. where they are on. Oh, I should have written that down. They are looking for these magical little uh, thermally active gemstones that heat or that uh, emit light. Yeah. Uh, in the presence of heat. And so they're very popular as human jewelry. And uh, 
Jack is, you know, blowing up things and doing explorations to try and find them because they're extremely profitable. And uh, he goes home one day to find out that he's no longer alone in his little house. There's something in there. It's a little fuzzy thing. <laughs> it's about the size of a cat, but it walks on hind feet. <laughs> and as as Jack begins to um, learn about this thing, which he initially initially considers an animal, he begins to think it's highly intelligent and it has a family and it's a tool user. There are these little animals, other animals called land crabs and uh, yeah. <laughs> little fuzzy, as he eventually calls this, uh, this, this creature, will take his his stick and flip the animal over stab it in the center of its chest to kill it and then peel back all the shell to eat what's inside mm -hmm. and he realizes this is a very important thing because the big bad corporation will lose its license to be on the planet if there is an intelligent sentient species so he brings in some friends to document what's going on and he notifies the corporation the corporation loses their mind and in the process of them trying to learn about the animals, they kill one of Little Fuzzy's, I'm going to say tribe for lack of a better word, maybe mm -hmm. family. Yeah. And Jack shoots the guy that kills the little baby Fuzzy in, in revenge or in frontier justice because yeah. uh, killing a sentient is illegal in the galaxy. Yeah. And then there's a very protracted uh, legal discussion about who can do what and how you can do it. And we then we learn that the, the fuzzies are intelligent. They just speak in a range of frequencies so high above us that we can't hear them. Yeah, which is a, a nice science fictional element, I suppose. Yeah, it reminds me of, uh, you know, thinking about dolphins being intelligent or whales. Yeah. Of course, they speak in the other frequency range or elephants even. Yes. And because we don't, we don't either can't hear it or don't understand it, we have a hard time understanding or recognizing their intelligence and sentience. Yeah. There is one thing the fuzzies do or say that we can hear, and that is yeek. Eek. <laughs> they say that all the way through the world. Yeek. Yeek. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got here the, the, the description of Little Fuzzy when he first appears. Uh, this is what H. Beam Piper writes. He says, He turned quickly to see two wide eyes staring up at him out of a ball of golden fur. Whatever it was, it had a round head and big ears and a vaguely humanoid face with a little snub nose. It was sitting on its haunches, and in that position it was about a foot high. That's the creature that we're talking about, and they're called fuzzies, because they are fuzzy. <laughs> Something that surprised me about Little Fuzzy is that it very specifically and explicitly talks about ecology. And I didn't expect to see that in a book from 1962 because to me, any knowledge of ecology is more sort of a 1970s thing. So it felt as if it was ahead of its time, whether it really was or not, I don't know. I may just be ignorant of that. But at the same time, it felt as if the story wasn't really on an alien planet. It felt as if this was a story in Africa. Yeah. The, the sunstones or whatever it is that they're mining are diamonds. There's seem to be a lot of background characters who have sort of Dutch sounding names or Afrikaans sounding names. And it really felt to me as if this was a writer who was, who was really modelling the world on uh, Africa and was sort of science fictionifying it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I can see that. But that's, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Um, but I think it does make it feel a little bit dated because it feels a bit like it's from a colonial era uh, and not so much from our modern world. But at the same time, it's got this concern for ecology, which does make it feel a bit more modern than it is. So it's a, it's a really strange mixture. I also felt, felt it was a very patchy book. It seemed to raise issues uh, multiple times without necessarily dealing with them. So it would talk about uh, sentience but not go anywhere with it and then bring it up again at a later point, but not deal with it. And then ultimately make it the center of the court case at the end where we need a kind of a legal ruling on whether these creatures are sentient or sapient, I think is the word he uses. Yes. Um, so it felt like a first draft. Nevertheless, it was better than I expected it to be. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I, I think I did. 
Yeah, socially, I don't know, socially, because the way everyone interacts is you go to somebody's house and, and watch their fuzzies and you smoke and pull out a pipe and there's lots of <laughs> drinks that are created. And that culture, I think, still does exist today to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it re yeah, reminded me of watching old Perry Mason episodes and in a way. <laughs> yeah. Everybody smokes and everybody drinks. And There's a little scene fairly early on where we're first really getting to know Little Fuzzy and what he can do. And we see that he's learning and he is, in the words of the book, he is generalizing. So, for example, Little Fuzzy learns how bottle tops work, screw caps on bottles. Oh. He, he figures out that if you turn, if you turn it, sometimes it will come off and sometimes it won't. And he figures out that, no, to take it off, you've always got to turn it the same way. And to put it back on, you've always got to turn it the opposite way. So we see a process of learning. He does the same with a nut and a bolt. I can't remember quite how he comes to have a nut and a bolt, but he does the same thing. He sort of figures out how those work. So mm -hmm. I thought th this was nicely done in a visual sense. And I could see that in a movie. And I think, don't we find that the fuzzies have their own tools for breaking open the land crabs, mm -hmm. but the, don't they personalize them or something or, or, or modify them? They're created by hand. They're not just picking up a stone and using it as right. a scraper. They're shaped. Yeah. And uh, Jack gives them metal version of their tools, which then they can, they actually trade to other fuzzy people. Right. There is some joining of a tribe, like they find some other wild fuzzies. And it turns out that the fuzzies that are, you know, Jack's friends uh, need more mates. And so they're about to go to war and then they, they make peace and they join together. And then their Jack's tribe continues to grow. I wish I'd written down the names for all the different fuzzies. <laughs> some other interesting things as we begin to learn about these creatures, we begin to learn about how people determine whether an alien species is considered sort of worthy of being thought of as sentient or sapient. Yes. And a, a sort of a rule of thumb that is mentioned a couple of times is the talk and build a fire rule. So, you know, if you come across an alien species and you find that they talk and they build fires, then they are probably sentient or sapient. One of the characters also says, Anything that talks and builds a fire is a sapient being. Yes, that's the law. But that doesn't mean that anything that doesn't do those things isn't. Well, and because we can't hear these fuzzies talk and they don't build fires, they're still, uh, right. you know, I would say Neolithic almost. Yeah. Except they have wooden tools. So that's probably not the right phrase for it. But Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, as you say, later on, we learn that they do talk, but they just do it outside of our hearing range. Uh, yeah. our, our frequency range. What I found interesting is that uh, although this planet is sort of operated by a, a company, a corporation, there is also a federation. And it, it did feel very much like Star Trek. And it made me wonder whether Gene Roddenberry had ever read H. Beam Piper. Yeah. I wonder how much of a common thread that was. This idea that, you know, like the United Nations, that you could have independent countries or colonies or planets that needed some overarching system of organization and regulation and rule enforcement and support protection. Yeah. So you're thinking this this might well have been a, uh, a common thing in science fiction of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So much to learn, so much to not know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd have to read everything, wouldn't we, to try and figure out where his influences were. Yeah. <laughs> I was struck by, by several quotes through the book because some things are so different from the way times, you know, our culture is today in, in 2023. Yeah. Other things are very familiar. There's a quote right from the beginning of the book from the psychologist. Um, it says, if you don't like the facts, you ignore them. And if you need facts, <laughs> dream up some you do like. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems very familiar in our in the United States these days. Not just the United States, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> a bit later on in the book, there is talk about... We can talk about the difference between an intelligent alien and um, a sort of a an alien that is more at the level of a cat or a dog or something like that. But mm -hmm. there's a, a very sharp uh, observation that comes out in a piece of conversation where 
somebody talks about collecting fuzzy pelts you know so not even farming these animals or using them as pets but literally hunting them down and taking their skins you know which is what humans have done for thousands of years but then somebody says that would be genocide if you killed all those fuzzies for their pelts yeah and uh the, the character replies, nonsense. Genocide is defined as being the extermination of a race of sapient beings. These are fur-bearing animals. Yeah, that puts a, a very clear demarcation line between what people consider exploitable and what they consider not exploitable. It was at least conceivable. And you know, who knows if it's actually happened or not. That would be pretty scary. Yeah. Although it does define the evil corporation pretty well. Yes, it does. Uh, and I, I have to say that's my least favourite aspect of the book, because I think it's, to me, it's a bit of an irrelevance. Uh, the fact that the author has happens to have written this story in this corporation colony. I, I think the issues to do with intelligence and how how you treat other species are far bigger than that. And I think to make it largely about an evil corporation is minimising the the moral and ethical debate to a large degree. And I think that carries over into Scolzi's book, because I think he emphasises all of that as well. So I don't find that so interesting. I wonder if you could re-envision this a third way, where there is no corporation, but in the process of learning about these animals being intelligent or not, somebody kills one. Mm. And so then there would be a trial to determine, did this person commit murder or was he just, you know, they just kill an animal for some reason. Yeah, I, I think I would prefer that. I'd prefer it to be more pure in that sense. But it's OK of its type, you know, it's, it, it, but I think that's part of what makes the book feel dated. I think all of the corporation stuff feels dated, even though Scolzi updates it, um, it. It still feels like a very old fashioned kind of storytelling. Yeah, evil corporation does evil. Yeah. There's also discussion about whether language is that important. Yeah, somebody makes mention of Helen Keller, who is the, famously the uh, deaf-blind woman who... I think she became a writer, didn't she? I think so. Well, I mean, she was famous just for the fact that since she could not hear or speak, that she could communicate. That's right, yes. And her... I uh, can't remember the name of her facilitator, but there was she had an, an assistant who helped her learn to uh, communicate with the outside world through sort of um, finger spelling and, and touch rather than through vocalisation and so on. So she she's brought up simply as an example of somebody who was clearly intelligent but didn't have the power of speech. So that comes into the discussion of, well, these fuzzies aren't can't be sapient because they don't talk of course it turns out they can talk so it, that's all moot anyway but uh, it, it, these are interesting little philosophical nuggets that are being thrown into the discussion and i like all this stuff yeah I, I, that's one thing i like about science fiction is it it, it makes you think yeah how, how do we define people and how do we find intelligence and how are our laws and morals applied in some situations and not others? And is that really the right thing to do or not? Yeah. And historically, of course, what we've done as a species is we've tended to say, these are the boundaries of intelligence. Um, so um, unless you can speak and unless you can use tools, you, you're not intelligent. You're, you're just an animal. And then we find animals that do use tools and we find animals that do use rudimentary language. So these are intelligent, yes? And of course, when we get to that, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. They have to do these other things as well. We've, we've come up with these five other criteria. And it, it seems like we're always inventing new criteria, new hurdles for a, a, a hypothetical intelligent species to have to leap over. And I love this kind of discussion in science fiction. Equally, there are some things which are just bizarre. So there's a, a one little scene I've got on my Kindle right here. While they watched, Little Fuzzy snapped the lighter and held the flame to the pipe bowl, puffing. <laughs> <laughs> so he learns how to smoke a pipe, for goodness sake. <laughs> it, was a if it, isn't, it was a different time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sometimes science fiction is just written in our language, and in other times, words get invented and thrown into the lingo. Mm. Uh, and I, one of the things I enjoy is how well they're integrated. So one of the other recognized sapient species are the cougar. Oh, yes. yes. They're, they're not very smart, and they're not very likable. They're defined <laughs> that way. And so into the vernacular is, you know, you can be a dumb son of a cougar. <laughs> Something which... I found disappointing on behalf of our species. I, th I think, I, I may be wrong in this, but I think by the end of the book, it's kind of decided that, yeah, these fuzzies are sapient. Mm -hmm. But somebody says, you must think the fuzzies are going to need a lot of protection. They will, says the other character. And they talk about, well, there will be a fuzzy reservation and it will have to be policed. And then the fuzzies outside the uh, reservation will also have to be protected. And he says, you know, it's going to happen. Everybody wants fuzzies. Why? Even the judge approached me about getting a pair for his wife. So even though this species has been judged to be sapient, the best that we can do for them is to create a reservation and keep them as pets. <laughs> and I don't think this is being said ironically. I think this is just being presented as, oh, this is the, the inevitable next thing that's going to happen. I was a bit a bit shocked by that. Yeah, I remember that. Because I was and thinking they were going to get the, get the planet to themselves, you know, that all the humans would leave and uh, the fuzzies would have the right of self-determination. Yeah, well, that's the prime directive in you speaking. Yeah. I see some parallels here with slavery. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. we found yeah. these intelligent creatures, but they're not quite as smart of us. So we're going to take them on as house staff and field workers and pets instead yeah. of yeah. recognizing them as independent people with rights and desires. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if um, doing it any other way would have felt a bit too advanced in 1962. I'd love to know whether it felt like an uneven book back in the day or whether readers in 1962 thought this was a you know, a beautifully laid out philosophical discussion of an issue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a huge advantage we have these days. We, we could go search Reddit and see what people's opinion are on books or Goodreads mm. and get, you know, public and professional critics as well and see what their take is on, on books in various ways. Yes. To do this in 1962, we would have to hope that somebody wrote a letter to an editor or there was a column in a magazine. Yeah. And go to it or see if there were, you know, fanzines that wrote about this that might be yeah. Yeah. around. And and who knows? I'm, I'm looking up right now real quick in ISFDB, which tends to cover publication history for works, hmm. uh, to see if they have that. Okay, there there is a 1962 review of Little Fuzzy by P. Schuyler Miller. It, uh, it doesn't uh. say where. So, yeah, I mean, if we I should have done a little more research on this. Well, perhaps we could have a look and then uh, come back to this in a later episode. Yeah. Well, John Scalzi liked it so much that he, he did reboot it, as we've learned. Yeah. Do you know what his motivation was? <laughs> yeah, I read a little bit about that. He has an excellent uh, interview in Clark's World where he talks about this on the 10th anniversary of the publication of Fuzzy Nation. And I'll make sure you get that link so we can drop it in the podcast notes. Hmm. Um, but the short story is this. He was in a contract dispute with Tor, Tor Books, right. and uh, was kind of uh, at liberty to do what he wanted. And he wanted to do a fun project. And he had liked the novel and it was in the public domain. And so he, in his free time, kind of like what Brandon Sanderson did during the pandemic with his four <laughs> secret novels, mm -hmm. wrote this reboot modernization of the fuzzy story called Fuzzy Nation. Mm. And it is, uh, it's yeah, it's it's very John Scalzi like because of the the technology and the snark and the uh, the writing. Although uniquely, uh, this is the first time he wrote a protagonist that is. I'm going to be blunt. He's an asshole. <laughs> the the Jack Holloway from the original book. We like Jack. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. We're I I kind of liked the new Jack Holloway. But the things he does, and it's like, yeah, that was wrong. You probably shouldn't have done that. And then he ends up paying for it in, in the plot in various ways. And yeah, he's, yeah. he's a jerk. He's dishonest. He's selfish. 
Yeah. As I was reading it at first, I wasn't enjoying that characterization, and I didn't think that the book knew what it was doing to that character. But as you say, at the end, there is a. Um, I mean, the character actually comes out and acknowledges what he is. So, the, yeah, the author and the book clearly know uh, what they're doing with the character there. But mm -hmm. he, yeah, he's not as likable as the uh, original character, the, the Piper version. Yeah, I mean, he does have a dog, and that's always yeah. a good redeeming quality in humans for most yeah. humans. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the dog Carl ends up being, I don't know, he's he's a scene stealer, just <laughs> in uh, a, adorable and interesting ways. Yeah. Um, if you if you pay attention to the plot closely enough, you can learn through the little fuzzies' interactions with Carl that they're actually intelligent. Because they, they learn that Carl is a is an animal, but he has certain rights that that they don't. Like he can come in and out of the house because there's a an electronically <laughs> keyed flap. Yeah. And they train him to open the door for them. Yes, that's right. So that is the first difference that sort of hits you in the face. I I immediately felt that aha, this is now going to be commenting on the previous version of the story. Because now we've no longer got humans and fuzzies and nothing in between. We've now got this sort of continuum that's built up. We've got humans, we've got intelligent animals, which are not sapient, i.e. dogs. Mm. And then we've got this other species, and we're going to try and fit them in somewhere in between the two extremes of human and dog, if you like. Um, so I thought that was a wise move. And I also felt if ever anyone makes a movie of this, they're going to keep the dog, most definitely, because it's one of the, the best parts of the story. Oh, yes. What do you see as the big differences between the original novel and Scalzi's remake? The highlights of the plot are all there. Yeah. But the... But... Oh, how do I describe this? It would be like having the same... The same skeleton, but different musculature and... Mm -hmm. uh, hair color and eyeballs so that yeah. while fundamentally at the very core, it is the same. I mean, yeah. it, it's a highly canonical adaptation, mm -hmm. but you know, with, with the main character not being, you know, the old Pappy Jack with his pipe and his, <laughs> and his, his <laughs> whiskey, uh, this is, you know, fallen lawyer, Jack Holloway, who lied and lost his girlfriend cause he lied about her and mm -hmm. uses dogs to blow up mountains <laughs> and, uh, is is manipulative and yeah. yet you know recognizes the sapience of these creatures and does not fall prey to the temptation to just hide it you know so there is some some moral founding to him and there the other characters are much more in the forefront in this story than the other story and they sort of have relationships to each other uh, whereas i felt in the the piper version they're just characters who come on because they have one plot function and one function only. All of that is an improvement over the original novel. But I don't I don't know in my heart of hearts whether it does make the the reboot any better than the original in any significant or substantial way. I think the business with the dog does improve things. The rest of it just seems like um variations on a theme but for no particular reason. No, I, I think you're right. The like, I think the discussion of the ecology of the planet that is being ruined by evil corporation, mm. that's not present in the new book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think that there are, you know, there's not the struggling of defining sapience quite as much mm. in the newer story versus the older story. Yeah, yeah. I personally like it better, but that's, I think that's because I'm so familiar with Scalzi's works and I, I really enjoy his style of writing and what he brings out. Yeah. In fact, at one point, you know, I was I was hoping that Jack and Ruth, the the Zeno psychologist, would be reunited because of what Jack's, you know, <laughs> his uh, his heroism and the good things that he does. And it turns out that no, that that's broken and can never ever be repaired. And mm, yeah, does it feel as if uh, this book is connected to any of Scalzi's other books? Okay, let l let me freestyle for a little bit and then yeah. maybe draw something from it. Yeah. So the thing I'm getting is. Uh, pets are a central part of John Scalzi's life, and so is family. Okay. 
And so seeing those connections in this book makes me realize, yes, this is Scalzi. Although if you look at his other books, that's not such, that's not something so much in the fore. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I recognize it from his writing because he writes and blogs uh, a lot. A character with snark, who's extremely intelligent, who's trying to put one over on someone else, that is quintessential John Scalzi. <laughs> so if you like that kind of a thing, you'll like his other books. Right, yeah. Um, his books tend to be, I think, very smart. Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna find something and say, well, I, this is a nitpick that I don't think is quite right about this because his writing is very polished. I think it's very well thought out. Now that could be the fanboy in me talking too. You well, know, yeah, know. yeah, but it's 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 often the, the kind of thing that draws you to read another book by the same author. You know, you get a feeling for um, the the tone that is characteristic of their authorship. Um, incidentally, I, I listened to the audio book of this, which is narrated by Will Wheaton, oh, and yeah. he he is perfect for this because he he does snark really well. I mean, <laughs> he's he's most famous for sort of playing rather innocent characters, both in Star Trek and before Star Trek. But um, you know, if you've seen him doing any comedy, you know that he is also uh, quite good at that, and he, oh, yeah. he really does get the snark tone uh, for this. It's it's very well worth listening to. Yeah, and he does read a lot of John's works. Oh, does he? Ah, he okay. does. Yeah. yeah. He. I wouldn't say he has some favorite. Maybe he does have some favorite audiobook narrators. Hmm. Um, Zachary Quinto does an excellent job of doing his audible production book called The Dispatcher, and uh, I think Amber Beeson has done several books. I, I wrote down most of the expansion slash updating slash new material in Fuzzy Nation is about the corrupt corporation which leaves me totally cold. So I, it felt to me, I mean, it, it, th this is a, a ridiculous comparison really, but do you remember sort of primetime soap operas in the 80s, oh. Dallas and, and Dynasty and Falcon Crest and all of those? They were always about corporations and usually members of families screwing each other over in the name of business. And that's what this reminded me of. It's I, I'm reading it and I'm thinking, I don't really care about any of this. Yeah. If there's a modernization to it, I think there's, they actually back off on the evil corporation biz a little bit and bring out the evil CEO. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because when the, when the new prospective CEO, the, the new heir oversteps his boundaries, uh, in the very end, his handler steps in and, you know, starts to fix things. Yes, yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, once the final adjudication goes against him, it's like, yeah, you won't have to worry about him anymore. He's not going to be causing anybody else problems. And <laughs> and the, the courtroom drama in this version, in Scalzi's version, obviously it takes up a large part of the book, as it does in H.B. Uh, and Piper's book. But the Piper ones seem to be much more focused on the question of sentience or sapience. And in the Scalzi telling of the story, it seems to be much more about kind of playing dirty tricks on the other side. So, um, f for yeah. example, H Holloway accuses one of the characters, I forget the name of the character, um, but he accuses him of murder because he killed a fuzzy. But right. he makes that accusation. I mean, he hints at the accusation earlier on in the book, but he, he formally makes that accusation in court just after the judge has basically said that fuzzies are sentient. But the, the killing took place before that judgment was made. So, you, you know, you can't, you can't establish a legal um, precedent and then apply it retroactively. You can only say from this day forward, it will be murder if anyone kills a, a, a fuzzy. But Holloway makes that accusation straight away, you know, and it, it's sort of presented in this melodramatic way as, oh, he's got him now. But <laughs> no, not really. And the contrary position, the position that I've just put, doesn't come up, doesn't come into the discussion. So I felt that it was the courtroom stuff was all a bit melodramatic and some of it, frankly, was nonsensical with the judge making things up as they went along. So I wasn't really very convinced by the courtroom stuff at all. How yeah, it feel? does seem more like a frontier law. Yeah, 
It does. Yeah. You know, it's not well established. It has to be developed. And although the part about establishing sentience and retroactiveness is they suspected that the fuzzies were intelligent and were trying to cover it up. True. And so given that aspect, I wonder if it would apply retroactively. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think that also happens in the first book. I suppose it does. Yes. Yeah. Right. So uh, the evil henchman stomps a fuzzy and kills it. Jack shoots the evil henchman. The corporation uh, demands that Jack be arrested because he's murdered a human. And Jack mm-hmm. counters saying, well, you killed a sentient. Yes. And so yeah. they have to establish the sentience before they know if it's murder and then go from there. Yeah. And the logic of that seems a bit more persuasive to me. I mean, whether legally that would pan out, I, I don't know. But in terms of storytelling logic, that's, that seemed plausible. But I felt the way Scalzi was doing it uh, didn't feel quite as plausible. Um, there's, there's one little element which I think is present in Piper's book, but I don't think is in Scalzi's. Or if it is, it's, it, it's sort of glanced over. Mm-hmm. And that is, uh, in the Piper book, the fuzzies we learn bury their dead. And that is sort of used as a little moment for reflection on, well, that probably means they're sentient then, because we do that. You know, again, this is one of these things, we do a thing, therefore it must, that's got to be a criterion for considering somebody to be as worthy as we are. Yes. Um, Uh, There's a particular quote from the book that I really like that I'd like to read. hmm. Just to give people a a feel for for his writing and, and kind of what we're talking about with Snark. Yeah. Um, Carl was frustrated, but he was also well trained. Any dog that could wait for an order to detonate explosives was one that knew how to listen to its master. And of course, Carl, <laughs> Carl has been trained to actually um, blow things up on uh, Jack's behalf, hasn't he? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the way I think it worked was uh, Jack took Carl when he would detonate these explosives to try and find the sunstones, and. Uh, Carl is trained to recognize the word boom. Boom is a bad (laughs) thing. (laughs) And so to help Carl adjust and become used to boom, he teaches Carl to press the button to make the boom happen and then get a reward (laughs) afterwards through classic desensitization techniques. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Good dog. Good dog. (laughs) Yes. Um, there's, There's just one thing that I highlighted in the Kindle version of Fuzzy Nation. And that is the, uh, it's something I don't normally even read, but on the um, sort of the page, the copyright page, where they have the library classification information, it has three categories for this book to be sort of filed under. And uh, one is life on other planets, fiction. The second one is space colonies, fiction. And the third one is corporations, corrupt practices, fiction. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that that really states it quite clearly uh, what the the three um main threads of this book are. Yes. <laughs> if you could only read one fuzzy book, which one would you would you choose? Oh. <laughs> I know it's a silly question because you've read both, but yeah, and I read the Scalzi one first and then learned where it came from. And I went back and read the original. And, and for me, that's odd because when in my other podcast, I am well known for always reading the book first and watching the movie second. Right. Uh, there's a couple of times we've reversed that to see if that causes a bias in me. Mm. And it yeah, yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Um, but that's just that's the way I do things. I go to the original and then I go to the sequel. Yeah. And I didn't do that in this case. <laughs> And because, you know, my, my initial response would be, well, I think I would take the Scalzi book. Mm. But, you know, there are elements of the first book that I would miss because they aren't here in this book. Yeah, that's an interesting way to have an, an interesting order in which to have read them. So I, I did the opposite. I, I did read the early book, the original book first, followed by the um, the reboot. And but even so, I think I would recommend that people read the Scalzi version simply because i think it is an easier read because it it's it, it's sort of extrapolated from our world and therefore it's it's sort of a bit easier to understand i mean not that little fuzzy is difficult to understand but 
it, it's quite clearly a weird mixture of the futuristic and the clunky because it's from this earlier time. I mean, for example, mm. there's uh, in the court case, they have a, a kind of a lie detector, don't they? I, I can't remember what it's called, but in the, oh. the Piper book, it's a, um, a truth divining machine that everybody who's testifying <laughs> has to uh, suffer. But that's not in the Scalzi. He doesn't bother with that. He just goes for melodramatic argument, legal argument. Um, and there's some other things as well. Actually, it's it's these minor things that have stuck in my mind that um, in the Piper book, they they call each other up over Zoom because they're, they're not just on the phone. They're, they're using sort of video phones. I can't remember mm-hmm. what he calls them. Um, and that felt very Star Trek again, because that's what they do in Star Trek. You know, they press a button and they talk to the Vulcan ambassador over Zoom, essentially. <laughs> but, so that's the modern bit. That felt modern. But the, the very non-modern bit is that when you put in a call to somebody over Zoom, um, you talk to their secretary first, and they then put you through. <laughs> oh, So it, it, that felt really 1962, you know, like going through a switchboard operator. But then again, that is very Star Trek. That's what Uhura's job is. You know, okay, let, let me ask you a question. Hmm. If if you needed to talk to the president of the University of Wolverhampton, <laughs> would you dial him up directly on on Zoom, or would you arrange something through his office? I there there, there is a direct number. I would oh. do, I could I yeah, but he wouldn't answer. You see, it would be oh. a secretary. It would be a um, a PA who would answer. So, yeah, you're quite right. That is the same as our world. But um, it, it just seemed to happen every time anybody made a phone call in this book. <laughs> Whereas in real life, it's not like that. You know, a lot of people you can call up and you don't have to go through a, through a secretary. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I take your point. Yeah, because you and I don't have secretaries. No. <laughs> I think one time I jokingly referred to my wife in that in that fashion, and she quickly, very quickly disabused me of that fact. And <laughs> I have learned since then. Yeah, overall, then I I think I I think I slightly prefer Piper's take on the story because I think he's focused a little bit more on the philosophical argument, but the overall feeling is that it's quite a dated telling of the story. So Scalzi's makes a bit more sense um, and it it's probably more even in tone as well I think Piper's book is a bit uneven in tone and is a bit repetitive in places and it doesn't um, it doesn't feel properly structured it feels like it's being made up as it goes along Scalzi's feels a bit more structured because of, obviously he's had the benefit of reading a, a first draft which happens to have been written by somebody else uh, in a sense yeah, but can you think of any other book that does this? That essentially oh. it's. I mean, we're we're talking about adaptation, and we all the time we see films that are based on a book. We very rarely see books that are based on a book. We, okay, we see sequels. But yes. We very re- rarely see somebody doing a rewrite. Yeah, I, I can think of a lot of sequels off the top of my head, yeah. like um, the Night of the Triffids. Yeah, which is the sequel yeah, to the yeah. Day of the Triffids, but was yeah. written decades later. Yes, and um, I'll be mentioning this later, but uh, there is an a sequel to Who Goes There hmm. by uh, Campbell. Yeah, but again, that's a sequel, not a reimagining or a modernization or something yeah. else. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes people will say in their works, you know, I was really, I was strongly influenced by this book, and so you can see the influences in there, but it's not where you take character names and the skeleton of the plot and build a new thing around it. I don't mm. think I've ever come across that, mm. which just means I may not be widely enough read. Yeah, uh, same goes for me as well. I mean, I, I can't really think... I can think of parodies and I can think of um, yeah. sequels and I can think of people kind of expanding on a, on a universe that somebody else has created, but I can't think of anybody basically rewriting a book. <laughs> that somebody else wrote. <laughs> we don't have a quiz this week, folks. Um, 
I hope you're not disappointed. I know, <laughs> I know some people enjoy the quizzes, uh, but we'll have one next time, I'm sure. Um, but that means we can move straight on to our usual discussion of past, present and future. So I'd like to lead off with a past item. Having read H. Beam Piper, uh, I was prompted to look at his body of work and see if there was anything else that I wanted to read. And I came across a short story called Omnilingual, um, which I've seen in a couple of anthologies over the years. I, I don't particularly remember it, but I read it on uh, Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg, because uh, it's a, another one of these out of copyright stories. And uh -huh. it, it's quite good. Again, a little bit dated in, in some respects, but it's a story about scientists finding uh, archaeological remnants of an extinct Martian civilization, and they try to decipher some kind of document, and they succeed in, in doing it. And I saw, when I was re reading around it, that some writers and critics have really referred to the story as being a, a kind of a quintessential science fiction story. Um, even allowing for the, the sort of the trick that the, the story depends upon. Um, so, yeah, so read some more H. Beam Piper. If you don't have time for Little Fuzzy, just read what is probably his best short story, Omnilingual. Do you have any past items, Colin? I do. There was a recent article on Tor's website about the Cordwainer Smith Rediscovery Award. Mm-hmm. This was started in 2001, and it's for what the what the jury thinks are unjustly forgotten science fiction authors. Okay. And so if you're interested in reading past science fiction, you should uh, look up the Cordwainer Smith Rediscovery Award and find who these people are and see if their works are available and read them. Very good. Are these uh, announced annually? Yes. Yeah. Been running since 2001. The inaugural winner was somebody called Olaf Stapledon. Oh, yes. I've read some of him. Yeah. Okay. He's British, uh, you know. Oh, no, I, I didn't. <laughs> yes. Uh, Henry Kuttner. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lee Brackett. M many authors, you know, some yeah. of which I think we've actually covered. Yeah, indeed. So let's do present then. Uh, I've got two present items. The first one is, um, I, I don't like to plug other people's podcasts, but uh, <laughs> I came across a podcast called Dead Planet Society the other day. It's a new podcast from uh, the New Scientist magazine. And they basically ask hypothetical questions and then try and figure out the answers to them. And in the first episode, they, they take this rid ridiculous question of supposing we wanted to put out the fire of the sun, could we do it by having a huge ball of water the same size as the sun? So they, they talk oh. through the logic of, well, what would happen if you try to make a ball of water that big? And because, you know, my first instinct is to say, well, the gravitation would cause it to sort of collapse in on itself and maybe it would turn solid. And so it would be an ice planet. Um, <laughs> but they, they talk through what would really happen. Um, I mean, some of this is pure speculation, but some of it is, um, is, is well explained scientifically. So they just take these sort of odd science fictional ideas and then look at the consequences of them. So that's Dead Planets Society. Planets with an S on the end. Ah, and you really like that? Yeah, I, I've, I've only heard the first episode. Um, but yeah, it was, it was good fun. Do you know the webcomic XKCD? I know of it, yes. I have seen some of it, yeah. Yeah. So Randall Monroe had a blog series called What If? Yes. And then he published a book from there, which is literally chock full of questions like that. So now you mention it. Yes, this is a bit of a ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, you know, there's only so many questions that people have time to explore. Yeah, like, you know, yeah. not everyone's going to ask the question, what happens if you throw a baseball at the speed of light? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or can you put out the sun with a sun-sized ball of water? Or, <laughs> And I have to say, I still don't know. I listened to the whole podcast and they, they went through so many, so many alternatives. I, I, I couldn't tell you whether you could put the sun out with a ball of water. I don't think you can, but I can't remember now. <laughs> Uh, my other present item is, speaking of Tor.com, which has been mentioned a couple of times in today's show, um, They, a few days ago they put out a 15th anniversary short fiction bundle, oh, uh, yeah. basically an e-book um, with some of the best short fiction that they've been publishing in the past 15 years. So, I mean, they've always 
put stuff up for free um, as well as the you know the, the stuff that they publish for sale um, but this is quite a nice collection of um, modern-ish science fiction so well worth a look we'll have a link on our blog for that what present items have you got? I have a couple, and they're they're uh, pretty unusual. Uh, Fuzzy Nation could almost be considered fan fiction. In fact, when John Scalzi was interviewed about mm. it, he said, "Yeah, I wrote fan fiction about yeah. a little fuzzy." Yeah. And Andy Weir on his Twitter page recently endorsed a piece of fan fiction for the from the Artemis universe, his second book. Okay, uh, it's called Artemis: The Fra Moro Job, <laughs> and so it's set on the moon. And uh, in that universe, with that, you know, the base there, Artemis base, and mm -hmm. it, it was a good read. I'll, I'll make sure we have a link to it so people can read it. Very good. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I mentioned this in, in brief, uh, John Betancourt came and found the original version of the shorter story, Who Goes There, which was called Frozen Hell, and then yeah. ran a Kickstarter for the, the publication of it in hardback and EPUB form. Right, yeah. And he has now written a sequel to that okay. called The Things from Another World, <laughs> which talks about the, the, the things themselves and the, the, the further threat to humanity from finding more of them and what it, what it means about our place in the universe. Okay. Uh, and then for the future, um, I shall do a, a shameless plug here. Uh, in a few days' time, well, in about six days from now, as I speak, um, we have the official premiere of The Crystal Egg. Uh, I'm, I'm in a, an online drama group and we basically meet over Zoom and we perform and what we've been rehearsing for weeks it seems is an adaptation of an HG Wells story called The Crystal Egg which is a kind of kind of precursor to War of the Worlds. He actually wrote it the same year that he wrote War of the Worlds um, and Basically, we we perform it um, as a as a verbal performance. During the rehearsals, we started adding in illustrations to kind of relieve the tedium for the viewer of having to watch us <laughs> in a Zoom meeting reading from scripts. And the further we went on, the more we felt that we didn't want to be seen on screen, and it became an illustrated performance. And I did all the all the illustrations using AI. I had to tame some AI to make it uh, provide <laughs> images for me. Um, and so we have the premiere of this on the 30th of July on YouTube. And after the premiere, it will stay on YouTube so people can go and have a look. We're only amateurs, so don't judge us too harshly, <laughs> but it might be worth a look. I've had some, I've mentioned this to people that I thought would be interested in it. Hmm. And one question that has come up a few times is, are you going to do a live uh, broadcast of this or will this be a recording that is in like a YouTube premiere on yeah. the release date and then be available? That's exactly what it is. It's a YouTube premiere. Yeah. So we, we talked about doing it live, but um, there are various reasons for not doing that. One of which is the time zone problem because I'm oh, in the yeah. UK, some of the other pe um, people involved in the group are on the west coast of the US, some are on the east coast, some are in the middle. Um, and actually finding a decent time for a, a live performance was, was difficult. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, uh, it reminds me of the, uh, the full cast recordings from Alien Voices. Yeah, I, I don't think we're in that league. Um, I mean, we kind of have, have ambitions to be in that league, but obviously we're not um, Leonard Nimoy or... John Delancey. John Delancey, yeah. So we're not in that league as performers. But, uh, yeah, it's that kind of thing. And we, we've got a few sound effects in there as well. Um, the, the next three to four months are really exciting for me because a lot of the things that I like I have new releases coming out. Uh, the, the release of the series Ahsoka is at the uh, midpoint or end of August. Uh, John Scalzi's new work, Starter Villain, is coming out. There's going to be a new Murderbot book. Okay. And I want to say there's another release of a book in Mary Robinette Cole's Lady Astronaut universe. Okay, yeah. So a lot of good reading in my future. Mm. Yeah, but that's all for me. 
I think that's all from me as well. So thanks for listening, everyone. We're Phil Nichols and Colin Kusky. Our theme music is from purpleplanet.com. Check out the show notes at 101sf.blogspot.com, where you can also leave us a comment, or, well, you could even drop a couple of quid in the old tip jar. And uh, don't forget to give us a nice five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time. Mm